So if you have been on this journey through the book of Philippians with us, you know that Paul, each and every step of the way, has been talking about how we should have more joy. If you haven't been on this journey with us and you just happen to be here this morning, it's okay because I'm going to do a full recap of the entire book this morning. <laughs> You're laughing, but I actually am. But it'll be really brief because um, what I want to talk about is here in chapter 4, Paul, kind of the key verse here is he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And he thought any time in Scripture that something is repeated, it's to significantly raise the importance or the significance of this. And so Paul is really shouting with a megaphone, rejoice! Rejoice! And he's been saying that throughout the passage. So let's kind of look back and, and what he has said so far because Paul has given us a lot of the whys, why we should rejoice. He started off, he said he wants us to rejoice because of the partnership in the gospel. If you remember, we, started, we actually started before the book of Philippians. We looked at Acts. And we talked about how God used unusual suspects to build this church. He didn't pick out the best and the brightest and the smartest. He really has never done that throughout history. Thankfully to me, otherwise I probably wouldn't have a job. But Paul has always used, un, or God has used unusual suspects, one being Paul. He started the Philippian church with Lydia, a seller of fine purple goods, a jailer, a slave woman, and other people, and he used that to build probably his most successful church plant. And Paul rejoiced, he tells us all to rejoice because of the partnership in the gospel. He goes on later in the chapter to rejoice because the gospel is being preached. Paul is actually in jail. And he's sitting in jail as he writes this book. And some people are actually preaching the gospel to get Paul in more trouble. And Paul says, I don't care. I don't care why they're preaching the gospel. I don't care if they're trying to get me in more trouble. I don't care if they're doing it for good reasons. The fact is, they are telling people about Jesus Christ. And I rejoice because of that. And so he's telling us to rejoice because the gospel is being preached. It's going out. People are learning about Jesus, and that is something to rejoice about. He goes on later to rejoice no matter what your circumstances are. Again, Paul is in jail, and he's probably facing death. I jumped ahead one. He's, he's saying... I'm probably facing death. And he has that famous verse in, in Philippians 1, verse 21. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, if I get put to death, great. I get to be with God forever. Awesome. That's better by far. And he says, but if I don't get put to death, that means more fruitful labor for me. In other words, I get to continue preaching the gospel. I get to continue telling other people about him. So Paul says, rejoice, no matter what's going on in your life, rejoice, despite your circumstances. And then going into chapter 2, he says, rejoice, have an attitude like Jesus, who in humility did not consider himself. He was in the very nature of God, but he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And we should rejoice because Christ has that attitude, and we should have that same attitude as him. At the end of chapter 2, he says we should rejoice because of those who have come alongside us in our life and helped our faith to grow. Paul, in the Philippian church, points out Timothy and Epaphroditus. And he points out how they have helped the Philippian church, how they have helped Paul, and how they've come alongside. And, and he, we should all rejoice because of the people in our life that have helped us grow in our faith. Think of those people in your life. Maybe your parents, maybe your grandparents. Maybe a shockingly handsome pastor. <laughs> or maybe Pastor Andy even. <laughs> oh, he's already gone. So, but the people in your life that have helped you grow in your faith, we rejoice because of those people. In chapter 3, he, Paul talks about his own story, and he, he says that he had all this going for him religious-wise, but he says rejoice in knowing Christ above everything else. Everything else, he says, is rubbish. 
Anything you think you have going for you in your life is rubbish compared to the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. And Paul says as you experience the knowing of Christ, as you get closer to him and you know him better, you'll experience more and more and more joy. He says, not that I've already obtained this, but I keep pressing on towards the goal. Paul, the the superman of Christianity, says he hasn't gotten there, but he keeps working towards it. And we rejoice in the same thing. And at the end of chapter 3, he says we rejoice as we await our Savior Jesus coming again. That Jesus is going to come again. Paul believed that was going to happen any day. Even though Jesus had just left, he had this attitude that Jesus was going to come again any day. And he rejoices as we await the day that Jesus will come and take us to be with him forever. And we should have that same joy. And then finally, in verse 4, he tell, in chapter 4, excuse me, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. But in chapter 4, Paul, as he's summing up this book, as he's concluding this letter to the Philippians, Paul turns a little bit of a corner. Because he's given us throughout the book all of the whys. Why should we rejoice? Paul's given us many whys. And now he turns the corner and he gives us a little bit of the how. How do we rejoice? And so this morning I want to spend just a few moments with you all talking about the how. How is it that we in fact do rejoice? In the midst of life that can, that can bring us circumstances that don't seem so joyful. In the midst of a life that has a lot of up and downs. How do we actually rejoice in the Lord always? I'll say it again, rejoice. So let's look at that. The first thing that Paul tells us here in the start of chapter 4 is he says that we rejoice through restored relationships. We rejoice when relationships that were broken come back together. And the first of those relationships is our relationship with Christ. Paul himself tells us sort of his story, his, his testimony, so to speak, in this, in chapter 3. He talks a little bit about this, right? Paul, before he was Paul, was Saul. That's right. Paul, he was Saul. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was so religious that he took it to the point of persecuting the church. Saul was there when, when the first deacon, Stephen, was stoned to death. That's why people don't volunteer to be deacons very much. The first one got killed, and you're like, yeah, doesn't sound like a fun job. All right. But Paul is there, and he's he's giving approval. He's holding the cloaks of the people that are throwing rocks to kill Stephen. He's going out, and he's seeking out Christians. At the time, they weren't referred to as Christians. They were people of the way. And he's persecuting them. He's throwing them in jail. The special effects lighting is free, free of charge, guys, just in case you're wondering. So Paul is so religious that he's, he's actually persecuting the church. He's doing these things. And then Saul, is, he's, he's traveling on this road to Damascus towards Syria. He's going there and to try to find more people of the way. And as he's on this way, a bright light blinds him and he falls to the ground and a voice cries out Saul, Saul why do you persecute me? The voice is Jesus' voice and he's, he's asking Saul why he's persecuting him and Saul has this transformation and he goes from this super religious Pharisee to this follower of Jesus Christ His life is completely changed. And he goes from persecuting the church and and throwing Christians in jail to being the best missionary in the history of the church. The greatest church planner, planting churches, building the church all over. Because Paul has this restored relationship with God. And the reality is, it's not just Paul. Saul becoming Paul with this restored relationship. This entire book, cover to cover, 
is about restored relationships with God. Starts out in the very beginning, right? Adam and Eve. God creates this perfect scenario for them, this, this beautiful garden for them to live in. He says, just one thing you can't do. Just like all of us would, they do that one thing. The relationship with God is broken. And the entire rest of this book is about how God pursues our hearts to restore a relationship with us. Throughout the Old Testament of the Bible, it's about how God pursues the people of Israel and then they follow Him and things are going well. And then they forget about Him. And things don't go so well. And then God sends someone to remind him and the relationship is restored and everything's good and then it happens over and over and over again. Maybe the most vivid example we find in the book of Hosea, which is, which is really almost like a summary of all of history. God calls Hosea a prophet and he says, Hosea, I want you to find this woman, this prostitute, and I want you to buy her. And I want you to marry her. And Hosea does that. And Hosea loves her and marries her. And, and, but again and again she leaves and goes back to her old life. And again Hosea pursues her and buys her back again. And it's this, this cycle until finally, finally, his love so overwhelms her that she stays. And that's my story. And that's your story. We have a God that loves us so desperately, and even though we run in our own direction away from him, sometimes he pursues us continually. He pursues our hearts. Until eventually we're so overwhelmed by God's love that we, we can't run anymore. That's the story of this book. It's all about restored relationships with God. Through grace, God's incredible grace and forgiveness to us. And the reality is, in this particular situation, Paul is highlighting these two women. And these two women in the Philippian church are having a disagreement. We don't know exactly what the disagreement's about, but they're, but they're, but they're not getting along. Most likely it was over a guy. That's what women fight about. Most theologians think it was probably Bill Giggy. We don't know for sure. We know through archaeology he was there, but we don't know that he's the source of the problem for sure. And so we're looking at this, and Paul is pleading with them to restore this relationship because that's at the very heart of God, restored relationships. And it happens in the exact same way that we have our relationship restored with God. It's through grace and forgiveness. And you all know in your own relationships, when you have extended grace and forgiveness to someone else, how does that make you feel? Joy. When you've received grace and forgiveness from someone, how does that make you feel? Joy. That's the very heart of God. It starts with the fact that we have a God that loved us so much he sent his son to die so that we could have a restored relationship with him. What a beautiful thing. What, if there's ever a reason for joy, that's it. And then in our own lives, that we would have restored relationships with each other by extending grace and forgiveness in the same way. That's a beautiful thing. And so that's the first how that Paul gives us. How do we have joy? How do we rejoice? By having a restored relationship with God and by having restored relationships with each other. Second way, maybe. Did I turn it off? Oh, there we go. The second way we rejoice is when we give our anxiety to God. We give our anxiety to God. Going back to the text. Verse 
Paul says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, the reality is, anxiety is a huge issue today. I can't remember a time in my 44 years on the planet when there had been so much anxiety all over the place. I got home on Monday from uh, my time in Israel to find out that one of my very best friends from high school and my youth pastor's wife from high school and middle school had both just committed suicide on Sunday and Monday. Riddled with depression and anxiety to the point of not being able to cope. And, and I hear that story over and over and over again and it's, it's, it's heartbreaking and it's devastating and it's destroying families, it's destroying relationships, it's destroying lives. But that's not what God wants for us. That's not what he wants for us. God says, don't be anxious about anything. I read a story about a woman named Amy. And uh, Amy's testimony is that her entire life she's riddled with anxiety. From her childhood all the way through. In her childhood, it was about looking the right way and making the right friends and achieving the right grades and, and doing these things. And she felt so much pressure and just a huge amount of anxiety. And she always thought, it'll get better when I'm a grown-up and I won't have this pressure. And it, it never did. It only got worse. And the anxiety resulted in, in panic attacks. And, and sometimes she was just paralyzed. She couldn't even move or get out of bed and would call in sick to work. And she was a woman of faith, and so she would, she would try to pray. But her story is that even as she tried to pray, she couldn't even get prayers out because she was so riddled with anxiety. She didn't know what to do. She turned to psychologists and, and nothing seemed to help and she even turned to psychiatry and, and some, some drugs that might help with her and nothing, nothing made it easier. Nothing made it better. Nothing would take the worry away. Nothing would ease the anxiety. She had a group of uh, women who prayed for her regularly and one of them said, have you ever read Matthew 6? Next time you feel anxious, read Matthew 6. She said, I'll try anything. I'm sure I've read it before. But she began every day starting to read Matthew 6 in the morning. And then whenever she would experience anxiety, she would read it again. And it's from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Starting in verse 25, here's what it says. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, much more valuable than they? Can any one of you add a single hour to your life by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was clothed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Don't worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear. The pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And it's not that there's anything magic in those words or special, but as, as Amy began reading these over and over and over again, eventually what happened is it clicked in her life. 
that she has a God that loves her desperately and that wants to meet all of her needs. And it's not that the anxiety left, but when it came, she remembered this truth and she was so washed in this truth that that's where her thoughts went. Her thoughts didn't go to all these wild and dark places like they normally went. They went to God. And she was able to pray for the first time when the anxiety hit. Her testimony is, for the very first time in her life, she experienced this peace from God, this peace that passes understanding. This peace that doesn't even make sense. Because that's what God does for us. Maybe you struggle with anxiety, maybe you don't. But know this truth. And this is the key truth. We can rejoice because God is God. Here's what that means. God is in control. He's in control of everything. And more than that, God loves you desperately. You know that? Do you know that truth in your heart? God loves you desperately. And no matter what you're going through in life, God wants to use that situation in a positive way. Might not always seem that way. Might not always feel that way. But God loves you desperately. He loves you so much. He gave his son's life so that he could have a relationship with you. He loves you so much and nothing, no circumstances in life can take that love away. Romans 8 says, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not famine, not nakedness, not the sword, not angels, not demons, not principalities. Nothing in all of creation can take God's love away from you. And that is why we rejoice. Amen.